Thanks for having me. So uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, continuations. And the talk is in the four parts. And it's four dialogical parts, which you're going to understand in a second. OK? So the first part is an illustration of continuations with a university level uh, learning. So it's an actual course, lecture that I have given, that you are going to give. And then uh, to illustrate, we'll see Caldo mobiles, which are bi binary trees. Um, and then we will arrive to the heart of the talk, which is continuations. And then we'll finish with a study of interpreters, running interpreters, running interpreters, running interpreters. OK, so uh, that chapter is about lazy evaluation, okay? otherwise known as demand-driven uh, education. Okay? So imagine that you had a whole lecture about that. And then to sum up, that's uh, demand-driven computation. So to summarize, uh, using OCaml. Uh, Can I turn up your mic a bit? What? Can I turn up your mic a bit? Absolutely. Thank you. So bottom line, there is a series of, of thank you. Thank you. Okay, so lazy evaluation, demand-driven evaluation. You don't do anything un until it is needed. Okay, and so in a functional programming language such as OCaml, computation are suspended with delay and subsequently resumed. And the first time that the computation is resumed, the result is memorized. And, and the computation continues, and uh, you can trigger a bunch of resumptions. Okay, so that leads us to the postulate, which is the non computation. Yes. Um, and so data can be constructed either as values uh, on the fly or on demand by need. So their constructors are then called either by value eagerly or by need lazily. So new data are constructed either in inductively using pre-existing other data or recursively on demand. Thanks for attention. <laughs> I kind of like this idea of demand-driven computation. It seems economical. Actually, that's how I read the lecture notes. And yes, it is economical. <coughs> Beg pardon? That is how you read the lecture notes? Well, yes. First, I look at the mandatory exercises. If there aren't any, there's no need to read the lecture notes. This is such a time saver, considering how many other courses I am attending this term. <gasps> you don't read the lecture note? But why? There's a question about it at the exam. They can't be M, because thanks to modern teaching methods, the exam has to be aligned with the mandatory exercises. If there is no mandatory exercise about something, that something cannot be as the exam. Oh, that's that uh, simple and oh, okay. Uh, after all, most uh, notes do contain mandatory exercises. Yes, they do, but the demand-driven idea still applies. I only look at the mandatory exercises, and if I can solve them there, then I am done, which is good. Because remember, there are many other courses I'm attending this term. <laughs> Yes, you can. Which one is that? But uh, does that happen often? I mean, can you solve the mandatory exercises without reading the lecture notes? These exercises are supposed to test our understanding of the new presented this lecture. Uh, right. And that's where the demand driven idea is useful. I, I identify what I don't know in the exercise, and then I go for it in the lecture notes. Usually, I find what I need just before the text of the exercise, and then I'm done. <laughs> and what if what you need requires something that was explained much earlier in the book? And the, that is precisely the idea of being demand driven. Every time you find something you don't know, you look at what comes before in the lecture notes. 
Just use the search facility of your browser and look backward. Use the Google search facility of your browser. Because not everything is defined earlier in the current lecture. Though. Some things are defined in the previous lecture. Though. If I have already read the definition in the other lecture note, I've done. If I haven't, then I go read it. If I find I'm clear, I, it always comes with some examples. I read them too. And if I, if I find something else I don't know, I keep looking backward for definitions until I find what I've read already. I tell you, demand-driven reading is a great idea. It is so much quicker to go forward and only look backward when one needs it. Most of the time, one doesn't need to look backward at all. <laughs> but aren't you missing like, the narrative, the side notes, and the interludes? Do you even follow the Wikipedia pointers? Details and turn details. Don't mind the small stuff. Go forward and only look backward if it is needed. I rather mind. These particular lecture notes are not the internet. They are constructed inductively, and so they are made to be read forward, even though they come with an index for direct access. But then, but then shouldn't should. It, uh, it shouldn't make any difference if you read them forward or backwards, should it? If the lecture notes are well written, then you and I will learn just as much. I'll th uh, rather first see why we need to learn what we are instructed to learn. True, but still the exercises in the lecture notes are part of the lecture notes. So they don't tell you why we need to learn what we are instructed to learn. And neither does the exam. We only realize, realize that once this course is over. If we need it, then, then we already know it. Then now, no later. For what is for up, for sure, if we don't need it. Even so, someone who graduated is supposed to have a mediocre of, you know, knowledge, right? And meanwhile, they should, like, you know, study. Then I assume the driven. Thank you, I guess. My point is that when possible, we should not only be driven by necessity, especially if it's only for a short term only. You mean it's not sufficient to be driven by necessity? You mean you don't want to be drive your life at all? It's your call. And it is a call by me. We only live once. <laughs> Perhaps the point is whether one wants to learn in order to know or to learn in order to pass the exam. Nah, nah, you, you aim for the important and you hope that learning inductively will enable your going beyond the exam. And Loki, you aim for the urgent and you hope that learning recursively will be enough to pass the exam. Still. <laughs> Still. You continue. <laughs> Favorite reading reintroduces the stress of forward references and the reduced series of circular arguments. But safely, since we know that these references are in there, it's just a matter of finding them. Leave a little data. 
So the executive summary is that uh, Maynard has been teaching about demand-driven computation, and uh, the students are independently already using it in daily life. And uh, the strategy is their secret weapon to cope with the deluge of information that you will receive every day. So it's amusing that that secret weapon, the non-driven learning, coincides with the topic of the day, which is the non-driven computation. And yet, for many students, reading the internet books comes as a shock because their secret strategy is exposed. At any rate, using this secret weapon is not as irresponsible as what he suggests because something is useful if we reuse it. And if we don't reuse it, or if this reuse is not visible, is it useful? Okay, and uh, at that point you should wonder about continuations. And the point is that they underlie the non-driven strategy, and you're now wound up, so let's move to Clayton Mobiles. <laughs> so, the, yeah, so you can start. <laughs> the goal of this chapter is to represent Calder Mobiles as binary trees whose leaves hold natural numbers. To implement a predicate that tests whether a given binary tree is balanced and therefore represents a Calder Mobile, and to prove the soundness and completeness of this implementation. <laughs> Let us represent a Calder mobile as a binary tree where, for simplicity, nodes represent weightless bars and where leaves hold natural numbers that represent a weight. In Galina. Inductive binary underscore tree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the company file available on the device contains an implementation of the following functions. A weight function to complete the weight of a given binary tree, that is the sum of the payloads in its list. And that's our first recursive function. It traverses a tree recursively and returns the weight of all the subjects by adding them. So you apply weight to a tree and it returns the sum of all the values in the leaves, which is the weight. Next. A balance predicate to determine whether a given binary tree is balanced, whether for each node, for the two subtrees are balanced and have the same weight. So, if a leaf is balanced, if a node is balanced, here for that subtree is balanced, the right subtree is balanced, Okay, interlude. Alcyon, casual. Piece of cake to implement recursively. True that, but the given tree is going to be traversed like a lot. Yes, balance traverses the whole tree once, and weight traverses each of its sub trees. <laughs> Okay, that's a lot of terrazos. I'll give you that. Could we just traverse the tree once? step and the notes. Okay. <laughs> so in the base case, a leaf is balanced. Indeed it is. And we know it's weight too. That is true too. Now in the inductive step, given two subtrees, 
either they are balanced or they are not balanced. There are four cases, and in three of these cases, either one of the subtrees is not balanced, or the other is not balanced, or both are not balanced. And then the node that contains these two subtrees is not balanced either. But what about the fourth case? Good small holes. But in the base case, we knew the weight of the leaves. <coughs> Wait a second. We can compute the weight of a tree or whether it is balanced or both. Phase two, we can return to results. And how do we return to results, if you please? We can return a pair. Uh, okay, we can do that. So we return a pair that contains the boolean and the weight. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> we only need the weight when the tree is balanced. So using a pair is an overkill. You make it sound like the weight is optional? From the mouth of babes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use an option type. And when both subtrees are balanced, we know their weight, so we can compare them. So they arrive with a weight loss function. With the base case, the function side. And in the base case, they know the is balanced and they know the weight. And the induction set that checks both of these subcases, and if they are both balanced, and if it's the weight, it checks that it's the same weight. And if it is the weight, some of them are the same weight. Wow, this function traverses any given binary tree once to determine whether it represents a Calder mobile. Even better, it could traverse the other subtree only if the first is balanced. Look. And so instead of constructing uh, traversing both trees and the same subtrees at the same time, we first traverse the first, and if they are balanced, then only then we traverse the second, and then you do the same, and all the other things go in the top. But we want to complete a computer boolean, not an optional number. So we wrap the initial call with a discriminator. Look! So the balance is 28, cortex, the only one, which returns the function type. If it returns some of the weight, the same is balanced, and you explain the boolean. Otherwise, you can have that answer. So we return 4. Uh, this implementation traverses any balance tree once and one, uh, once only, calculating the weight of each subtree is passing, and traverses any unbalanced tree at most once, because if the left subtree is deemed not to be balanced, the corresponding right subtree is not traversed. Now, for the soundness of balance DP. So we write our first theorem. And the theorem of soundness is that. If our program were to construct the tree, that means that tree is balanced. So this theorem is a corollary of the following auxiliary lemma. Uh, now we have our first lemma that says that for all trees and for all the the way is the part of the tree. If uh, the auxiliary function is written in some of the way, that implies that the tree is balanced and the double group is equal. Next. This lemma is the Eureka lemma because it took ingenuity to state just right. It is proved by structural induction over binary trees. The induction step is proved by cases. The Leibniz. 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 The Leibniz inequality arising from each of these cases is named and subsequently used in an application of the Rewrite tactic. Bright face. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Sweepingly. Now, for the completeness of balance dp. So that's our second theorem. What is completeness? It means that if a tree is balanced, then running the program will return true. That's the symmetric of soundness. Carry on. 
This theorem is the corollary of the following auxiliary lemma. And the auxiliary lemma says that if a tree is balanced, then the auxiliary function will return sum of the weight of that tree. Next. This lemma, which is also a unique lemma, is proved by structural induction over binary trees. So now it's time for an exercise. Remember, it's a lecture. The exercise is please prove the soundness lemma and please prove the completeness lemma, of course, by induction. Let's continue the interlude. <laughs> the cleverness of the implementation resides in balance P auxiliary. Yes, this cleverness is captured by the partiality mona implemented by the option type. It is. <laughs> Professor Moby, Professor Walton, Butler, Professor Peter Jones, thanks for paying us a visit. And with the continuation mona, we obtain a solution that uses the continuation. And that's our first recursive function with continuations. So that auxiliary function is given a tree, is given a continuation that will be applied if it is applied to the weight of the subtree, and it returns a boolean. And it's defined by induction on the tree. In the base case, you continue. In the induction step, you first traverse the one with a continuation that, if it is applied, will be applied to the weight, makes a tail call to the second subtree with a continuation that, if it is applied, will be applied to the weight. And then test whether these two weights are the same. If that's the case, continues by, uh, on the sum of the two ones, and otherwise, does not continue and returns false. And the uh, Balance C is the original thing that calls balance C with the initial continuation. And the initial continuation is the last function to be applied if and when the, the program completes. Next. A classic. It is a beautiful example. Balance CB is still recursive when the computation stops at the first subtree that is not balanced. Before coming back to the beauty of this example, let us analyze a bit more its structure through a series of exercises. So, exercise two. Assume an exponentiation function, x2, that given a number will return 2 to that number. So, if you apply x2 to 3, it will return 8, 2 times 2 times 2, and so on. So, you're asked to prove a theorem. And the theorem is called the power of 2. And it says that for all 3, if that tree is balanced, then there are these two natural numbers, b and n, such as the weight is b times 2 to the n. Next. We are exponentiating 2 now. We hold the power of 2. <laughs> well, it's a binary tree. OMG! <laughs> yes, there are. Look at the inner conditional expression. And the inner computer, uh, conditional expression says if the two weights are equal, then you will turn this on. If W1 and W2 denote the same number, adding them is the same as doubling this number. And doubling the number is multiplying it by 2. Okay, proof of the model of the left. Um, yes, we guys to get CS3 to C4, which is the And since this multiplication by 2 is the only operation that's performed in balance dp of, we get a power of 2, which is something to behold, as I believe I was trying to tell you. What about the multiplicative factor for this <laughs> exponentiation? Wait for it. Exercise 3. Assume a function of smallest leaf, given the binary tree, will return the smallest of its leaves. 
and then you should put the following theorem. It's called the power of the sum of two, or any trace is bounds. And there is some end, but the weight is the smallest number of t times the smallest end, but two to the n. All right. The multiplicative factor is the weight of the smallest leaf, so to speak. Now, what about the exponent of two? Wait for it. And that's the next exercise where you assume a function depth that computes the depth of the tree, and you should prove the following theorem that says that for all trees that are balanced, then the weight is the smallest leaf times exponent that the depth of the tree exponentiated uh, two to the uh, depth of the tree. Let's see. Imagine that we have a full binary tree with identical payloads in the leaves. A, bina a full binary tree? Sorry, a tree where all the paths for from the root to the leaf have the same So here is a bunch of all the Weight is the result of multiplying the same payload with the number of leaves. I guess that gives us a recipe to construct Kelder of ours. Well, the recipe to construct Kelder of Well, yes, take a full binary tree with identical payloads in the leaves and replace any subtree with a leaf holding the weight of these. And if we represent it as a directed acyclic graph, its cost is linear instead of exponential. True, but irrelevant here, since the idea is to replace any subtree by a leaf that contains the weight of this subtree. Let me try, let me try. So he tries, and uh, that's the same case as before, except that then that something has been folded into a leaf that contains the sum of those. They are all Calder mobiles. You guys are doing great. So executive summary, all right? Calder mobile offer an excellent playground for binary If you want to decide whether a binary tree represents the Calder mobile, a solution in one pass is possible. But this solution can be expressed with the option time as well as with the delimited continuation, which is the topic of the next chapter. Okay, a quote that found in the book of Cocteau, a quote statement from French, that says that style is a simple way of saying complicated things. And I will tell you about continuation passing style. Okay, so a function is in continuation passing style when it is parameterized by its domain of answers, that's the type of its result. It is parameterized with the continuations, and all of its calls are tail calls. And the main function supplies the domain of answers and the initial continuation. That's it. Uh, that's it. Yes, that's it. Can you say that again? <laughs> of course, yes, that's it. Huh? Can you say that again, but more slowly and in greater detail? Is in continuation passing style if it's co domain, uh, if poly polymorphic, is, is, if is polymorphic, if it only contains tail calls, and if one of its parameters is a functional accumulator whose co domain is polymorphic. How about even more slowly? Of course, you're already familiar with tail recursive functions with an accumulator. Yes. <laughs> These functions are also said to be in accumulator passing style. Okay. Now 
visualize that. Now visualize that the accumulator is a function whose codomain is polymorphic. Okay. This function is said to be a continuation. So a tail recursive function with a continuation is a continuation passing style. Otherwise known as CPS Yes. I see. Well, that forces the codomain of a CPS function to be also polymorphic since the CPS function is tail recursive. Indeed, and if you logically view this polymorphic view as false, then the type of a result of applying a CPS function to this argument is the double negation of a type of a result of applying the direct style version of this CPS function to the direct style version of this argument. Come again. Okay, to be brief, look at the successor function. Are you looking? See how given n of type that the type of the uh, is that uh, how given n of type type the type of the uh, is a uh, if we view as, as false then this type is a double negation of that says the negation a is a false. So this is the type, a our force is a negation of that type, and now you have a, I'm sure, our function, which is the double negation of the type. I see, yes. If we view as as false, then this type is the double negation of mad, since negating a is a false. Arun, call my value now. Okay, I see that too. So the type of SAS is SAS is the successor is net to net and given answer the type of its call by value CPS counterpart is net error net error answer error answer. Yeah. Our call by value now. Well yes, if you assume that the argument is evaluated before the function is applied. What about call by name? Right, call by name means that the argument is not evaluated before the function is applied, but only when the variable it declares is evaluated in the body of this function. Yes, you explained this previously. Thanks. Here is the call by name CPS counterpart of the successor function. So, so CPS function is described as the rise of the number of answers that takes uh, a continuation that follows uh, so, the position of the function. Come again. The actual parameter is not evaluated. Instead, it is expecting a continuation that it will apply to the result of the evaluating of evaluating the actual parameter. Give yourself a chance. 
Give yourself a chance and then see how given n type of n of the type that the type of succession is that how given answer of a type type and given an actual parameter of x of type the type of succession n cap is that to the answer. I see. Yes. Make the same point for success and success we suggest just a minute ago. Uh, that to answer, to answer is a double negation of that. If we view answer as false. Right. In call by name, the same point holds for the actual parameter. Indeed, the type of the argument of sus is not, and the type of the argument of success and CPS is not to ans to ans given a type and. So succession maps, so success maps are not to a not, whereas given a type of answers, succession in CPS maps the double negation of not to the double negation of not. Right. Okay, and so you can see that in direct size, the natural function is mapped into a function that the shape of mass value is the same as the conversion. Small voice. That is because arrows associate to the right, right? Yes, Pablito, well spotted. Actually, a similar point holds for the result of applying successor and successor of these. Yes. The application of succession to a number is type net, and the application of succession with CBS to a type answer and a number has type net the and which is the double negation of net. We're almost done with types. Hang on. Indeed, the type net uh, error answer, error answer is that for a CPS computation to compute something of type net, syntactically it looks like a function k is net answer e, where e has type answer. To carry out this CPS computation, you can apply it to a continuation that says what to do with the resulting value of type net. Okay, I can see that too. In the successor and CPS, X denotes a CPS computation. And this CPS computation is carried out by applying it to a continuation to be applied to the resulting number. Even the continuation of a successor and CPS, this continuation is. So we abstract the, the function that maps on n to applying the continuation to the successor of that n. Uh, and when this continuation is applied to this resulting number, the continuation of success and CPS is applied to the successor of this number. Yes, this, that is why the initial call the continuation passing function specifies both a domain of answers A and the initial continuation, typically an identity function A with uh, the Wait answers A giving another, another continuation function. Look at the lecture note and it's a company material for several examples. Still, if we look at the types, call by name CPS gives something more symmetric than call by value CPS. And so you can see that successor maps not to not, successor and CPS maps continuation to double negation of not to double negation of not, and that one is kind of over. Next. Yes, as you say, successor maps a net to a net, various successor and CPS maps a CPS computation of net to the CPS computation of net. How call by name makes more sense for continuation passing style too. Prof Reynolds, thanks so much for passing by. Huh, mind autographing my copy of the definitional interpreters?
So there are many kinds of continuation parsing styles. Yes, there are one per binding strategy, i.e. call by value, call by name, etc. And I guess that there are many communication transformations. Indeed they are. Look at Chad Murthy's PhD thesis. Also, the standard term is double negation translation. Since all calls are tail calls, all the actual parameters are pure, right? Yes, indeed. They are value constructors. Literals of functions, abstractions, or variables. So CPS programs are independent of the binding strategy. Yes, Alfredo. Well observed. Now what? The only way we can distinguish between call by value and call by name is by applying a function that does not use its argument to an argument whose evaluation can be observed. Ah, right. If we make this observation, the binding strategy is called by value, and if we don't, it is called by name. Yep. And in CPS, all calls are tail calls, and therefore we can't compose functions, which would be the way to apply a function to an argument which is potentially observable. And therefore we can't distinguish between call by name and call by value. Correct. Your observation is due to John Reynolds, and it was captured by Gordon T. Plotkin in an independence theorem a long time ago. Indeed, and thank you. Uh, Prof Clocking, uh, thank you so much for passing by. Mm. Mind autographing, uh, autographing my copy of Core by Name, Core by Value, and the Lambda Calculus, and of Structural Operational Semantics. Of course. Oh, the original tank report. Good times. It's a pleasure to pass by, but please do continue. The answer time ensures that we can't compose functions. Right, since all calls are tail calls. <laughs> since the call domain of the continuation is polymorphic, this continuation is safe. Which, which brings us to delimited continuations, doesn't it? Thank you. A delimited continuation is one whose codomain is not polymorphic. Ah, so it can be applied non tail recursively. Or not applied at all. Witness the continuation based implementation of balance P. The traversal only continues if the continuation is applied. So back to the uh, binary, uh, to the binary C. The continuation is applied here. Yes, and yes. Is that a double affirmation? And the resulting programs are in delimited continuation passing style? And so the code domain of functions in delimited CPS is no longer polymorphic. Correct. In the example the type of K is net arrow two. How does one reason about continuation based programs? Carefully, for example, the following number relates balance DP ox and balance DP C B. One uses the option type and the other the limited the limited continuation. So how do we connect both? The recursive function that puts on some option type and the one that passes the limited continuation. Uh, that's done with, uh, there are two cases. Uh, so either the result of the value is sum or it is not. And then the, the together with that, as you did, there is the fact that when we apply value to the continuation is applied. And the other one, if it comes wrong, then the continuation is not applied.
this particular lemma is proven by structural induction of the T. But in general, one reasons about continuations by characterizing them relationally a bit as one would if one were to defunctionalize the unit. And delimited CPS is used for what? Many things actually, but most most both for functional backtracking. Functional backtracking. Don't apply a continuation and discontinue the current computation, or apply another delimited continuation than the current one to an intermediate result. Continue the computation elsewhere and then do something else. For example, apply the same delimited continuation to another intermediate result. This afternoon, Ya Hui Song gave a great talk about that SOC. Wow, we can simulate non deterministic programming this way. And demand driven computations too, you no? Know? <coughs> Indeed. The same fridge problem comes to the mind too. The reflexivity tactic is implemented like that in the crop proof assistant. Look at Look at Benjamin Gregory's work. What about unlimited CPS? It can be used to obtain the effect of exceptions by applying an earlier continuation than the current one. Question. Yes, Moksa? Saying that the type of the CPS program is the double negation of the type of a, a type of a what direct style program. Yes. Zero transformation over programs that corresponds to this double negation transformation. Sorry, translation over types. Yes, there is one the CPS transformation. There are several kinds of double negation translations. There are several kinds of CPS transformations, one for each binding strategy. Yes, look at John Hatcliffe's PhD thesis. So you mean that success VCPS and success NCPS are the result of CPS transforming success? But you're, you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to learn this transformation? Not from a Jedi. How do we reason about CPS programs? How do you reason about accumulator passing style programs? We use Eureka lemmas. Which we reset the accumulator. So we will need to reset the continuation too. Yep. Once again, look at the lecture notes and their accompanying materials for several examples. Okay. Okay, so to wrap up, as a series of bullet points. A zero recursive function with an accumulator is said to be an accumulator passing style. A function with a continuation passing style, or CPS, if it is an accumulator passing style, the accumulator is a function, and the codomain of the function of the accumulator are the same type variable. This functional accumulator is an undelimited <coughs> continuation. The codomain of an undelimited continuation is said to be the domain of answers. answers. There are many continuation passing styles, one per value strategy, called by value, called by name, and so on. Programming continuation passing styles are independent of the binding strategy. You can evaluate them in call by value, in call by name, won't make a difference. Programs can be transformed into continuation passing styles through a CPS transformation, and so can their types. If you interpret the domain of answers as false, the logical counterpart of the CPS transformation of the types is a double negation translation. Corresponding to there, the, the fact that there are many binding strategies on the CPS transformation for each of them, there are many double negation translations. 
in a CPS program, if each continuation is applied, if each continuation that is applied is the current one, then that CPS program can be mapped back to direct style. If uh, the continuation that is applied is not the current one, the current computation is, is, is discontinued. If the continuation that is applied is not the current one, was declared in the current lexical scope with this continuation as the effect of an exception in Okania or in the language. Okay. In the corresponding direct style program, the declaration is expressed as the declaration of an exception handler, and the application is expressed as the raising of the corresponding exception. And if the continuation is that is applied is not the current one and was not declared in the current lexical scope, but it was passed as an argument, then this discontinuation has the effect of a jump. If the corresponding direct style program, the declaration of the continuation that is passed as an argument is expressed with the control operator causes the continuation, and the application is expressed with the control operator C. The control operator calls CC captures the current continuation and declares a jump continuation. If the jump continuation, the control operator C discontinues the current continuation by replacing the current continuation with a jumpy continuation. And the first control operator is named J and is due to Peter Landing. Yes. So he did have a control operator as his middle name. That is correct. Prof Landon, thanks for jumping by. Huh, mind autographing my copy of the mechanical evaluation of expressions? A delimited continuation is a continuation whose domain is not polymorphic. So delimited continuation can be applied in a non calc form. In functional interpretation, implementation of the product programming language, logic programming, and more generally in program that uses functional backtracking, the success continuation is a delimited continuation, and the failure continuation is an undelimited continuation. If you defunctionalize the continuation of a program into a data type, and that program is in continuation by six times, you get a control stack. If you defunctionalize a success continuation, you get a success stack. And if you uh, defunctionalize a failure continuation, you get a failure stack. Success stack is represented as a list of stack frames, and the failure stack is represented as a list of lists of stack frames. In the direct style counterpart of the program in delimited continuation passing style, the current continuation is delimited with the control operator reset. The delimited continuation is declared with the control operator shift as a pushy continuation. And when you apply a pushy continuation, you compose it with the current continuation. If you see this transform a program that uses shift and reset, that gives you a program in delimited continuation passing style, and if you see this transform that program again, it gives you a program in undelimited continuation passing style that has both a failure continuation and a success continuation. If you iterate the CPS transformation, you get the CPS hierarchy. And the CPS hierarchy corresponds to layer monads, which is a bit under this PhD thesis. Um, yes, you are executive summary is getting out of hand. Yeah, useful exuberance. <coughs> Remember how we simulated call by name using call by value in Intro CS? Yes, we used tongues. So we can implement a call by name version of the successor function using tongues. So the successor function takes a suspended component. Right. And then we can apply successor to a number and successor n to a suspended number. And that gives the same result. The response window prints. <coughs> Thanks, Kalifito. Can we CPS transform successor n into successor n CPS? Looks like uh, that tells us how to uh, CPS transform uh, tongues. 
more useful in humans. So if we have captured a continuation, can we call the instead the refed continuation is a CPS procedure that receives the current continuation, ignores it, and requires K instead. Yes. And if one wants to compose these two continuations, one writes instead. So instead of drawing the first and second the first, write the results of the final part, the capture continuation. Yes. <coughs> uh, and if one wants to compose these two continuations, one writes instead. And so that's Yes. The code K is not a tail code, and so the code becomes sensitive to call by value and call by name. That we can fix once and for all with the CPS transformation. So you take the previous one, the transformation, Which made Peter Landon say once that these continuations have continuations. Which is not wrong. And to reset the continuation, that is to delimit it, one passes the identity continuation and one applies the current continuation to the result. Which is precisely the idea of shift and reset. Okay, it's simple. But how do we know that it is? I don't know the simplest. One comes back to the idea of meta-circular interpreters in direct style, where, for example, evaluating the application of two expressions is defined as one, evaluating the first expression and the second expressions, and two, applying the first result to the second. Then one CPS transforms this meta-circular interpreter, and the result is the CPS interpreter that one would have written by hand given an effective CPS transformation. Okay, and... It seems to me that the un undelimited control operator called slash cc is unanonymously accepted because in the meta security <coughs> interpreter, evaluating the application of call slash cc to an expression is defined as applying call slash cc to the evaluation of this expression. And CPS transforming this circular and this meta circular interpreter gives the CPS interpreter one would have written by hand, including the clause for call slash cc. Again, given an effective CPS transformation. Ah, that I did not know. <coughs> the value of this property is its objectivity. Okay, and Shift and reset have the same property. In the meta circular interpreter, evaluating the application of shift to an expression is defined as applying shift to the evaluation of this expression. Evaluating the application of reset to an expression is defined as applying reset to the evaluation of this expression. And CPS transforming this meta circular interpreter gives the CPS interpreter one would have written by hand, including the clauses for shift and reset, again given an effective CPS transformation. But this interpreter is not in CPS because of shift that composes the current continuation with the captured continuation, and likewise for reset. So if one transforms this interpreter in CPS, one obtains the interpreter two layers of continuations, one were written by hand. And if one defunctionalizes this interpreter, one obtains an abstract machine that corresponds to it exactly, which is also exactly of, true of all the other CPS transformed interpreters. Given Landin's SECD machine. Given Landin's SECD machine. What about abstract machines that are not in the functionalized form? Most of them, if not all of them, can be adjusted to be in the functionalized form. And then they correspond to a CPS interpreter? Yep.
which can be expressed back in direct style using a control operator if necessary. But yes, there's a lot of platonism. Yes, these results are more discovered than invented, but they are forced residing in their simplicity. For example, once one has understood the limited continuation, one doesn't need to learn monads because one has understood them already. It's in the same elephant. It also helps to have a kind of example. And that brings up to the reflective time on the end of this presentation. I know we're running out of time, but you really want to stay for, for, for that last part, which is a lot shorter. So that's, we get back to the end where we started. This is the end of the lecture note with an exercise. And the exercise is implement a function that applied to the representation of a set, return the set of all its subsets. A set is represented with a list of elements without repetition. Do you get exercise 5 power set and talk? Not quite on Pro 2, not quite. And for quite a while, my fragments of a solution are the breeze. Maybe we should read the interlude that follows exercise in the lecture notes. Sometimes that helps. Why not? Because I feel really stuck. Hey, Lou. This interlude is reflective. One eye is about us. Aren't they all? Still in this one, we are working on the same exercise. You perusing the lecture notes with the browser and me editing stuff with Emacs. And we look just as stuck in there as we feel out here. This reflective interview looks full of itself. Let's get back to the exercise. Wait, how about we keep reading and see what happens next in this interlude? Who knows, maybe what they do there will suggest us how to get unstuck in the exercise, so that we can move on. Actually, that's an idea. The hopeful one, yes. Man, they are working, their, they are wrecking their brains on this exercise. Their fragments of a solution are debris. A towering expert pops in the kitchen. Hi, I'm Smith. Agent Smith? Just call me Brian. The phone rings. It's an old style thing plugged to the wall. Wait, there was no phone before. And are we in the kitchen? Actually, yes, there was. Look at it again. Okay, I see a phone. See, deja vu, it's an induction step. Just get used to it. As for the kitchen, well, we're in the kitchen, no? This is getting confusing. But the phone is still ringing, and so Anton picks it up. Uh, hello? Who's there? Hi, thank you. You're our speaker. Big pardon. I said, I don't know. Oh wait, that'll be better answer for you. See, that's why I popped it. You guys are not really Anton and Frost 2 working on an exercise. You're Anton and Frost 2 in an interview working on an exercise. In the real Anton and Frost 2, Meta Anton and Meta Frost 2 for you are stuck on the same exercise of reading this interlude in the hope that what you do there will suggest them how to get unstuck in this exercise so that they can move on. <coughs> Happy to help, but it's an easy one, as I was just telling Anton. We just need to see what happens next in the interlude we are reading, and we will tell Meta Anton and Meta Frost 2 once we know, problem solved. <coughs> and our exercise too. In fact, we are the meta Anton and the meta alpha through for the Anton and the alpha through in the interlude we are reading. I mean, that we are trying to read. Can we get back to it? Because something is happening here, there. 
which by the way makes our meta intern and meta alpha to the meta meta intern and the meta meta alpha to of the intern and the alpha two in the interloop that we did, which is fine. And yes, something is happening. They are stuck in the exercise and they are about to read the interview that follows the exercise. <coughs> That's not good. We are supposed to solve the exercise, not do something else. We need to send them an extra. At your service. Can you go there quick before they read the interview? Of course, and tell them what? Whatever, go there quick. The expert lies down, checks in, and freezes. Okay, he's there. Well, he's there, and boy does he come as a surprise. He is introducing himself now. But what is he going to say? We didn't tell him. Right, let me call him. Meta Anton. Hold the line, please. Operator. say exactly? She mentioned a drill. Drill, isn't it? Not that. The other thing she said. Anton is about to pick up the phone. Am I talking to myself here? What do I tell him? Introduce yourself and tell them to stop doodling and solve the exercise so that we can all go home. Wait, why do you why do you want them to solve the exercise? And for that matter, why do Meta and the Meta Alpha <coughs> don't want you to solve the exercise? If you want someone to blame, <coughs> I suggest you look into the Meta Anton and Meta Alpha group of your Meta Anton and Meta Alpha group. Or even chances are into their own Meta Anton and Meta Alpha group. Can't they solve the exercise themselves? <laughs> well, let's not get carried away here. But we all want to go home. We all want to have a home to go home. Back to <laughs> Do you? Have you seen your home? Not for sure. Maybe not yet, but I hope I'll see it soon again. The way things are shaping. I don't need to explain to you that's an induction step, do I? The logic of this interview is getting tenuous. Do you guys need a chairperson? Prof Russell, thanks for stopping by. It's quite a crowd, Bob. Huh? Hello? <laughs> Who's there? Hi, Anton here. You are on the speaker. Back harder. I said Anton here. Oh wait, that would be meta Anton for you. This is going to take a while. You move your hands like that. Couldn't you just explain recursion first? Moving your hands. <laughs> Could you explain recursion first? Couldn't you just explain recursion first? <laughs> Guys, stop everything. The solution is just below. Told you. All right, and the solution is blah, 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 blah. OK? So the executive summary is, well, Dan Friedman and Mitch Warner at US uh, computer scientists were being simulating reflective powers. And that simulation is at the origin of the continuations. And the CPS transformation 
that precisely gives the one that, that uh, you would like to have connects with partial regression you know, for individuals and human uh, theory and that makes it possible to eliminate all the level of the power of these colors and you should read Nadia Alins and Sir Tom Street or uh, Topol uh, 2018 about that okay so to wrap up Continuations are a functional representation of control in programming. They intersect with a million of other concepts, and they offer a structure for programming, transforming programming, transforming types, reasoning, and so on, for things that are as concrete as implementing systems or designing virtual machines, to things that are as abstract as categorical and mathematical logic. And we can draw on the sample that there is to be, but one thing is sure, Understanding continuation in principle, in theory, and in practice opens the door to understanding many other things in principle, in theory, and in practice. And we have now reached the initial continuation. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Professor Olivier for coming down and giving us out. Can we have another round of applause? Okay, uh, before we end up, just a couple more slides and won't take too much time. Uh, so, special shout out to Jane Street, who is our sponsor for this semester. Jane Street have graciously offered us to sponsor Friday Hacks for this entire semester. And they're the reason why you got that free pizza and bubble tea. Uh, yeah, so do check out their website. We do not have the link that they were supposed to give us, but uh, do check out their website. They have a lot of great opportunities for you guys if you're looking for internships, or even if you're some of you are close to graduating and want to look for jobs. Uh, coming up next week, we have a whole lineup of events. So on Tuesday, on th Thursday rather, we have uh, a hacker school workshop, Game Engine Essentials with Godot. Uh, this is in collaboration with the NUS Games Development Group. The QR code to sign up is just over there, so you can just scan it and take a look. I'll keep it up for a few seconds. Okay, uh, next, next Friday we have another Friday Hacks. Uh, this one is by Sheila Theo, and this is titled How I Won GovTech Singapore's LLM Prompt Engineering Competition, and they've got three LLM products in 2024. Again, the sign-up link, uh, the QR code is at the corner of this slide, so you can just scan that and sign up. I'll leave that for a few seconds. And lastly, we are in your cycles. Do feel free to join both our, both our Telegram cha announcement channel for all the events that we have lined up, not only for this semester and this year, but forever, basically. And our Instagram channel where we will also post publicity announcements for all of our events, including sign-up links, times, dates, venues, and everything else that you'll need. Uh, I think that is the end, so thank you for coming. Uh, do do leave uh, leave us some feedback in this feedback form. I'll leave up the QR code, and if everything is done, you all are free to go.
It was too long. The middle was too technical. I didn't. I didn't like this. I added something to wrap up. I should have cut it. In the Sorry. I should have cut it. In the oh, I see. Like, could we have like informed you? Like, would you have changed the top if let's say we say everyone is like you? If you have like. If let's say we say like everyone was like less technical, would you have like changed? Uh, well, I kind of was happy to give a talk where you would have. Uh, like 50 concepts that you learn at the School of Computing that apparently you never think are useful afterwards. Yeah. And they are foundational. So called by name, called by value, uh, types, and logic. And so so, so, so that, that, that was, that was uh, definitely part of the message. You, you are, uh, uh, the difficult thing in the, if you only learn one thing, you know nothing. If you, if you learn several things and you see the connections, then you understand things. There is an alarming uh, tendency to only learn one thing and forget, and learn another thing and forget, and then you never make connections. And that, but if you want to be an educated computer scientist, is not, then you need to, to realize that uh, uh, well, the foundations are actually useful. I think so, there's nothing so that, that was definitely that, that was definitely a message that I wanted to give. I think you 